and to increase the effectiveness of the multilateral system with the United Nations at the core. The European Union fully support this text. This reform should reflect our commitment to the rule of law, to the humanitarian principles, to protect human rights and dignity for all individuals. But how can we be credible to reinforce our commitment to United Nations Charter and international law when Russia has started and continuing a brutal, illegal, and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine. How can we say that we are committed to the United Nations Charter when, in the Middle East, how many resolutions of the United Nations has been unfulfilled for many years? How many resolutions of the United Nations and ruling of the International Court of Justice have been completely forgot and not implemented by Israel. How can we continue saying that we are upholding the United Nations Charter when some relevant actors continue forgetting and misleading, not implementing what the United Nations institutions decide? We have heard President Zelensky here in New York. We support the key objectives and principles of this Ukrainian peace formula for a comprehensive and lasting peace. Only this path will bring a durable solution which matters beyond Europe as well. Many other crises, I mentioned only two, but there are Sudan, Haiti, just a new few. A call for an effective United Nations can uphold in facts the United Nations Charter and deliver our commitment to peace and security. In the Middle East in particular, it is indispensable to reach a ceasefire, to alleviate the catastrophic humanitarian situation and stop the escalation of violence in the region. As my colleague from Australia has said, Lebanon cannot become a second Gaza. And Gaza cannot become a second West Bank. And the second West Bank cannot become a third Gaza. The reforms addressed in the call for action are of key importance. I think there are three issues in which we have to focus our attention. First, representation and accountability. Second, financial vulnerabilities. And third, stop the global economic fragmentation. We need a comprehensive reform of the Security Council, talking about representation and accountability. A Security Council that strengthens the voice of underrepresented region and not only Africa. We need the United Nations General Assembly working better and more on the areas of peace and security. The second in the call for action is an effective international financial architecture to address global challenges. Together at G20, we have identified the potential to unlock about 357 billions, 357 billions in additional lending from the headroom by multilateral development banks. This is remarkable. Just mobilizing these resources would be already a great success. We have to certainly finalize the G20 Roma for a better, bigger, more effective system of multilateral development bank by October this year. We know what they mean. Private sector mobilization, domestic resources mobilization, increasing concessional finance for the low-income and middle-income countries. The third, global debt vulnerabilities. Low-income and middle-income countries cannot continue to pay their debt at the expenses of investment in education and help. Our priority is not to create new debt relief instruments, but to scale up the implementation of the existing one. The third dimension. You have to face the risk of geopolitical tensions sustaining the multilateral trading system and WTO rules as our best guard can rail against global economic fragmentation. We have to restore a well-functioning dispute settlement system accessible to all members. This is our top priority. 
Let me finalize by thanking again President Lula for his leadership and bringing the G20 closer to the United Nations and reminding us that the only true and effective representative rules-based international order we can aspire to global peace and prosperity. Your Excellencies, I wish a successful autumn to this meeting. Thank you.